I wonder how your year has been. Maybe it's been a revelation. You may have come to understand something new about God, about the world around you or about yourself that has been life-giving or refreshing. Or maybe 2019 was another year that just dragged on and kind of merged into all the years before it. And it's the 29th, you're tired, you're on holiday but you haven't really wound down yet and you're thinking there's only a week to go before I have to go back to work or whatever it is that is making you tired this year. Today we're gonna talk about four sources of God's revelation that can give us confidence as we approach the year ahead. Confidence in who he is and therefore being able to ground ourselves in that. So the four are creation, scripture, the incarnation, and our own experiences. And we'll start firstly with creation. Now having become a father for the first time, I knew this was gonna affect my sermons. Um, Something that's been in process for all of this year, pretty much, I've really actually loved the last month or so. I've been taking it fairly easy at work, just keeping things ticking, not working the full five days, just doing a couple of days here and there. I think it's the way it should be, just being at home with the baby and with his mum, and just enjoying who he is, because he grows up so fast. And most of my energy has been put into cooking, washing, looking after baby, and looking after mum. But I was driving down the motorway to work the other day, and I thought, I really love this, I'm enjoying this. And I looked at the sky and the trees, and I thought, God, you're good. And often when you hear somebody who's just become a father or a mother and they're preaching, they get really overwhelmed. and They think, oh, I just understand God's love for us so much more. It wasn't this big thing that I've... Um, that I felt, it was quite subtle, it wasn't overwhelming, Um, and the joy I'm feeling is just kind of just this, yeah, everything's okay with the world. Uh, Just a sense of deep satisfaction, and sometimes I can wonder whether the world is predominantly good or predominantly bad, but just it's the sense that maybe it is predominantly good. I've heard of people who are born again for the first time who see the world in this new way. They describe it like seeing for the first time and all of the world around them that used to be so plain, so inert, suddenly has meaning and life and reason behind it. And I started thinking about the fact that all of what I could see had been created. Some of it by God, some of it by the creative power that is placed within humanity. Something of the image of God that remains in all people, this ability to create, to not grow the tree, but choose where it goes and all those kind of things and build buildings and motorways and all this. And it remains in us no matter how far our hearts might be from God, we still have this ability to make, to be involved in the creation process. All of these things come from God and all of these are a simple reminder to us that we can see God in the creation at any point in time. It's a reminder that no matter where we are, no matter who we are, if we remember God, then he is with us. And at Christmas time, we get that reminder that God is with us in the Hebrew word Emmanuel. When I was studying Hebrew, I was quite surprised by this, I shouldn't have been, but we learned about different particles and how they all work within the the language. And I saw that Emmanuel is three different parts all stitched together, and it just literally is God with us. And I thought that was really cool. So the word Emmanuel, the name, reminds us that God is with us. And creation is a reminder that God is with us. Creation is always all around us. Even if we're stuck inside a building, we can see things that have been created or made and be reminded of who God is as the creator. And at this time of year, that reminder is more explicit when we do things like going to the beach or relaxing or going for walks and actually being reminded about who God is. But that reminder is available to us at any point in the year if we have eyes to see it. In Romans 1, 
Verse 19 to 20 says, For what can be known about God is plain, because God has shown it to us. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So creation is a reminder of God's revelation to us. And secondly, incarnation. Jesus is God. Some people out there would agree with this, but Jesus himself has said that this is so. In John 14, verses eight to nine, Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and it's enough for us. And Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? And so many people think that they know Jesus but haven't really realized, had that revelation that he is God. But he came to earth and he walked and we remember at Christmas time the fact that Jesus walked around and he revealed to us who God is. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father, Jesus said. And in John 10, 30, he says, I and the Father are one. There's no denying it. That's the claim he made. Next year, we're planning on running an apologetics course for a few weeks for the whole church to be involved in. When it comes to apologetics, I'm usually a little bit cautious. We've got these people who really love it, and it's kind of their bandwagon. They think, oh, apologetics, this is the way to lead people to Jesus. And apologetics has its place, but I'm usually a little bit cautious because of that all-in approach to it. I don't think it's necessarily wise to be showing the latest apologetics video to somebody and thinking that that alone will convert them to believing what we believe. Or giving books to people and thinking, hey, it's all laid out there, it's completely undeniable. It's an assumption that sometimes we have that people will see the truth and believe without any regard for the journey that they're on and the way that God is working in their lives and maybe that they need to be walked with rather than just argued into the kingdom. Even though that does happen from time to time, that a bit of apologetics, that some defense of the faith will be what helps them to come to see God. But my opinion, this is only my opinion, is that apologetics, so giving a defense of the gospel, is useful, mostly to us, to strengthen our own faith, to give us confidence, the confidence that we need to be able to stand upon the knowledge that God is who he is and who he says he is, to be able to then go and share him with other people at the right time as the Spirit leads. So next year we're gonna be running a short course about how to give a defense of our faith so that it can help solidify that knowledge for us. And something that's been mentioned before is the story of a man called Lee Strobel. There's a book written by him and now there's a movie about his story called The Case for Christ. And he was an unbelieving journalist who set out to disprove the Christian story once and for all by focusing on its centerpiece, the resurrection. And after careful scrutiny of the scriptures, he found that there was no logical hole in the story, the different elements of the witnesses that were there and how it all placed to get, was placed together. It couldn't possibly have been a lie. He couldn't cast enough doubt on the story and on the recollection in the Gospels. And eventually he had this crisis and he came to believe that doubting the resurrection on the grounds of resurrection just doesn't happen was actually a bigger leap of faith for him than doubting the historicity of the resurrection of Jesus. And what does that mean? means that he came to realize his position of doubt was less logical than a position of faith, and he became a Christian. Now, I'm not gonna go into the details that he went through. I think it's a worthwhile journey going on yourself. But suffice to say, I am absolutely and utterly convinced that the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus is an historical fact. It's fact, it happened. 
And it's only because of the great delay in time from then till now that there's even any room for us to cast doubt on it at all. At the time, a great many people believed, even thousands in one single day. And it completely changed the world. And we have that reminder when we celebrate Christmas and when we celebrate his resurrection at Easter. And in a pluralistic world, one in which anything goes spiritually, we can have confidence in our claim as Christians because God is with us. Jesus came and the accounts about him are solid and cannot be disproved. So the first two ways that God reveals himself to us, through that general revelation in creation and through the incarnation, that is the fact that God became a person just like us and has revealed himself to us in the flesh. And then thirdly, we have scripture. Now those verses I read earlier in John 4 from 8 to 9 are preceded by the famous verse 6. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. And I was just thinking this week about what it would be like to have a conversation with someone who believed that what is true for you is fine, but that doesn't make it true for me. And I'm okay with people believing what they like. After all, we're living in a world of tolerance now. And often people get upset with Christians because we claim something that is, at its core, incompatible with other beliefs. It's not just a belief system. It's based and grounded in the historical fact of Jesus. And it's so un PC these days to be a Christian because it's incompatible with other belief systems. It seems sometimes like everyone in the West is having a go at us. But there are two good reasons for that to be the case. One is spiritual and one is just logical. And spiritually, Ephesians 6.12 says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces in the heavenly places. And just as this morning we're surrounded by heaven's host, often I like to remember that out there, when we see this angst from people, there's a deception over their eyes to the historical fact of Jesus to the creation and the source of creation, the creator. And there are these cosmic powers, authorities, rulers, spiritual forces who are out there and blinding the people. And sometimes we think it's just somebody's against us, but they're blinded, and we need to remember that too. Behind all of the angst and contrarian opinion that we see in the world, we know that there's an army of spiritual forces working to hide the truth. But why? Because the enemy, the accuser, the devil, the thief, comes only to steal and kill and destroy. But Jesus has come that we may have life and have it abundantly. Notice how those verses, that verse that I just read um, in John 10, is from the same passage that we read earlier, that Jesus and the Father are one. And often people separate Jesus from God and talk about him as his son and say, how could a loving God send his son to die? But the fact is that God came in the flesh as Jesus. Yes, he's father and son, but that's, that's a way for us to understand how we as children can also relate to God. And in this passage in John 10, you have Jesus telling the truth. I and the Father are one. And at the same time, you've got these alternative facts, this fake news going on. John 10, 9 to 12 says, Jesus speaking, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. But the thief, the one with this fake news, comes only to steal and kill and destroy. But I have come that you may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd, and I, the good shepherd, will lay down my life for the sheep. 
The one who has a hired hand and not a shepherd, who doesn't own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. And any other belief system that is not grounded in the truth of who Jesus is, who God is as the creator, is like a hired hand, not a shepherd, has no real interest in the sheep, except to steal, kill, and destroy. And when the wolf comes, will flee, and will scatter them and snatch them away. So in the midst of Jesus revealing himself, that is God revealing himself to us, there's an accuser saying that Jesus is not who he says he is. To steal, kill, and destroy. And it was the same in the beginning when God, um, in, the, in the Garden of Eden, when the devil said, has God really said? And cast doubt. It's the same today. People cast doubt on the historicity of Jesus to cast doubt on scripture. But we know that Jesus is who he says he is and that gives weight to the entirety of scripture which testifies to who he is, which predicted his coming and so many facts about him that it couldn't possibly be coincidence. And the second reason, so the first is spiritual, the second reason that people are against Christianity and the gospel, or the good news as we like to call it, is because it is incompatible with other viewpoints. Logically, it can't be that Jesus is God and that there are millions of gods, or that Jesus is God, but there is no God, or that Jesus is God, but these other gods are the true God. It's just not possible. And it's especially hard today with globalism and immigration and all of that, all these different ideas coming for us to stand upon and say, actually, the one that we have is the right one. We're often seen as disturbing the peace or as bigoted. But God has revealed himself to us. We're no longer postulating or speculating upon who God is. He came down in the flesh and showed himself to us. All we're doing is relying on that fact. We're not coming up with theories. We know God. We know Jesus. We know the truth. And I recently read a tongue-in-cheek passage from Leslie Newbegin, a British missionary who spent much time in India before returning to the West and writing a lot of books. One of them is a favorite of mine called Proper Confidence. It's not very long and it's a really good read. It's not all convoluted, it's really understandable, but deep. And Leslie was appalled by his return to the West because of the tolerance of other views contrary to Christianity our heritage in God. He had first-hand experiences in India of the evils of other religions and the bondage that it kept people in. That fake news that the thief casts in different ways in different places. And the pain and suffering that come from them, especially when the devil gets in and scatters the flock and abandons them in that moment of need. And he knew that so well in India and upon his return to the West, he wrote a whole lot to give us confidence in our own faith so that we could stand in that proper confidence and know that what we believe is the truth. That we could continue to be set free and to set other people free from those alternative facts and that fake news. Not in proper confidence, but elsewhere he asked, is it better that we adopt the attitude of a humble seeker after truth, keeping an open mind, ready to listen to all that comes from the varied religious experience of the human race? Is it not more honest, as well as more humble, to stop preaching and engage rather in dialogue, listening to the experience of others and offering our own, not to displace theirs, but to enrich and be enriched by the sharing of religious experience. Not that we shouldn't listen to others and dialogue in an even-handed manner, but this idea that we should then go, oh, well, that's cool. Whatever's true for you is true. And I'll take some of that, and I'll take some of that. He was showing how 
illogical it is when you have the revelation of who God is to then go and ignore that for this false humility and to accept other things that are contrary to the truth. But that's precisely the view that most people today would wish that Christians would adopt. They wish we'd stop quoting those verses of Jesus which lay claim to exclusivity. But we can't. Scripture is so highly esteemed by us because it is the very word of God. In fact, John also wrote in John 1, 1 and 14, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we had scripture, but then the word came as a human being. God came and gave us this even greater revelation than just creation or scripture. We have the incarnation too. So the reason for our confidence in scripture is because of our confidence in the incarnation, in the historical fact. Neither scripture nor the incarnation can be disproved because both are the very words of God himself. Now, a little tangent here. As we dig deeper into Revelation, let's take a short journey through Scripture. In the beginning, God created. We've already talked about creation. And there's a theory among some biblical interpreters called progressive revelation. It's the idea that God reveals a little more of himself as time goes on. So there was creation, this general idea, and then there was the Old Testament, and now we have the New Testament, where we look back at the historical fact of Jesus, and we have a greater understanding through the living word, through God in the flesh, than we had with just scripture or just creation. Abraham, for example, he knew God, but he didn't have scripture to guide him, just the occasional word from God. Later, Moses downloaded the first five books from the cloud on top of Mount Sinai, and now we have Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy for the people for a good period of time to know God by. Imagine you're an Israelite, you've just come from Egypt, you're accustomed to their religion, their cultural practices, now you're in the desert, and you miss cucumbers, I have no idea why, and leeks and all of those different things that were plentiful in the lush fields along the Nile. Now you're in the desert, and your leader who claims to hear from God for you is up the mountain, he's been there for weeks, and you don't know what's happened to him. Exodus 32, three to four says, so all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. And they said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And we shake our heads and think, what absolute morons. That calf clearly didn't bring them up out of Egypt. But really, that's only half the story. That's not really understanding what was going on for them. In fact, they were just trying to put a face on God in a way that they were accustomed to. They still believed in the one who brought them up out of Egypt, but none of them had the Bible. None of them knew that having an idol was contrary to God's will. However, Moses, having just been up the the mountain in the clouds, comes down, and he has just been told by God that they shouldn't. He gets angry, he's appalled, just like Leslie Newbican coming back to the West. He gets all angry, and then he goes up and receives from God again. Anyway, they set this right, he goes back up the mountain, eventually they move on with their lives. And later Moses gives a reading of the law to the people, and they progress in their revelation of who God is. They've now got some scripture. And this scripture that they've got slowly gets built over the next millennium, And then for a while, all they've got is the Old Testament. But then Jesus comes and he gives us a greater revelation of who God is. So much so that that old law is pretty well useless for telling us how to live now. And here's the point. Genesis 1, 2 was written in a way that explained who God is, not necessarily how he created Now, let's not get into the debate about creationism or anything like that. That's not what I'm trying to illustrate today. But picture this. At the time, in the land to which Israel was journeying, there were creation myths aplenty. 
myths that explained the origin of the world from these different cultures and religions. And into that milieu that they were entering, God gives them to Moses on the mountain their own creation myth when we're talking about genre here, not that it's not true. And in the same manner of mythical storytelling, God gave Moses a description of who created the world. Just as in the desert, the people had attempted to put a face on the God who brought them up out of Egypt. In the image of a calf, God and Moses reveals that Elohim was the one who created. And Elohim is in the plural form. We're talking technically as opposed to theologically. It could be translated gods. In the beginning, the gods created. But all through the Old Testament, it's translated God, singular. And we now know that that plural form in the very first verse of the Bible was planted the seeds of our understanding of the Trinity, the plural God. And in Hebrew, they've got singular, dual, and plural. So it's not two parts, it's three parts there. And we see it right there throughout Scripture. In the whole of the Old Testament, this name for God, Elohim, reveals to us the Trinity. And we only understood that looking back after the incarnation of Jesus. And the Old Testament is the truth of Jesus concealed. And in the New Testament is the good news revealed. And today we have an even greater revelation of who God is, and we learn a lot about the world by scientific discovery. For example, we've been told of the Big Bang being the genesis of the universe, turning nothing into something. The greatest miracle of all, something that goes against all the laws of physics. And we read in Genesis 1, 1 to 3, that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And then suddenly, God brought something out of nothing. Let there be light, he said, and there was light. Now science can reveal to us and help us understand even more of what was already in the scriptures. For example, Hebrews 11 verse three. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. That's pretty deep for some 2,000 years ago. It's an amazing verse describing in one sweeping statement that what we see is made out of things that are not visible. That's getting down to some crazy subatomic um, science there all the bits and pieces, all the space between the different subatomic particles that holds all of life together. Something that looks solid is actually not that solid when you go into it. Things like glass, which is liquid, looks like it's solid. It's amazing. And none of this scientific discovery is able to disprove the incarnation or any of scripture. And the more that we search, the more we find verses like this that show something deeper, well ahead of its time. As we journey through scripture, we see a God who reveals himself to his creation. And the further we travel through science and technology, the more we see the truth of God's word and its potential for application for our lives. Some decades ago, there was a big push to discredit scripture, particularly the historicity of Jesus. But the scholarship that followed has only vindicated the Bible. Now we have Christian scholars digging deeper and deeper into the truth of the word, looking up things like their manuscripts and how accurate they are. And if we hadn't had that challenge, we wouldn't have this depth of scholarship and surety on the scriptures that we do now. Here's a simple fact. All truth is God's truth. The deeper you go into the word, the more you will see the truth. It can't be discredited, except by those who take arbitrary quotes from here and there, throw them all together and paint a false illusion, building a straw man argument. But anything can be attacked in this method. It happens all the time with celebrity quotes, politics, everything. 
But as we inspect the Bible closely, we find that scripture stands to scrutiny. And we see its application played out in the lives of literally billions of people now and throughout history. Isn't scripture amazing? The word of God. Not just the word in the flesh, but the word written down for us. The one who knows all and is taking us along for the journey, God, there's nothing that is a surprise to him. And as time goes on, the more we learn, it all just points back to him and confirms the reliability of creation, incarnation, and scripture as accurate and reliable witnesses to who God is. Now lastly, as we wrap up, our experiences. This can be one of the least reliable forms of revelation, but also it can be one of the most convicting and most motivating of them all. I had a friend tell me the other day that a sibling of theirs has walked away from her Christian roots because, as she said, I just don't feel that God loves me. She still believes in this God out there somewhere, but not in his personal nature because she hasn't experienced him. She grew up with the Bible with this understanding of who Jesus was, but because she didn't have that experience, she doesn't have that depth of knowledge and love. Now, some people have experience only and end up in the wrong place, but those without experience also can find that the revelation of creation, scripture, and the incarnation, it just isn't enough for them. On the contrary, I know personally that I could never walk away because the experiences I've had of God are completely undeniable for me, to the point that my conscience convicts me of his reality. Even if I never experience God again, I cannot deny the times in my life in which he has revealed himself. Now at the beginning I said, you may have had an experience of God this year. Maybe it was through the community that you found here at The Journey or through one or more of the messages from this pulpit, or through your own time spent sitting with God, driving, listening to, or reading the Bible, or any other source. Or maybe it was just looking at creation, feeling the sun's rays on your face as you wake out of the winter blues. Maybe contemplating the baby in the manger again this week. Or maybe you're dry, and thirsty, and tired. And you know about those first three forms of revelation, but you really want to experience God too. Maybe you'd love to put a face on the idea of a creator or a personal God. Whichever it is, I encourage you at this time to make room for him. There was no room at the inn, but there's room in our lives for Jesus. We can always make space. There's absolutely no, no question that he is the creator. He lived, he died, and he rose and lives again. Or no question that scripture is reliable enough to guide us through life. So I encourage you to seek God and to experience him. And I encourage you those of you who have experienced him, to recall those experiences. Relive them. Take some time. Remember who he is in your life. Next year will bring challenges in you, but I am very excited to see as we stand on the truth of who God is and remember who he is in our lives, how he can use us to bring that truth and that knowledge to the lives of others. We can have confidence because of creation. We can have confidence because of the incarnation, Jesus on earth. We can have confidence because of scripture. And we can have confidence because our experiences all remind us that God is with us and that he's in control.